Thank you. Everyone's here. We can bring. Thank you. Can bring in the jury. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of all the jurors, counsel, and defendant. Witness will retake the stand, and you can continue with your direct examination. Good afternoon, Aaron. Good afternoon. You, ready? you want to get some water? I'm all set. Thank you. Aaron, we left off um, before lunch break about the ammunition. So essentially we've got three sets of ammunition. We've got casings found at the scene. Those are state's evidence 103 to 110. You recall that? I do. And we have the, um, the casings that you shot, which is... Government Exhibit 101.1. Correct. Those are the fired items that I, um, I took from one of our submitted items, the collection of magazines that had ammunition with it. And then we also have um, rounds that were in Government Exhibit um, 135. Point one. The, the, the exhibit was 135 in the small magazine, 135.1. Um, I believe so. Th this is the one that we, we looked yep. at earlier, correct? Yes. All, all three sets, are they all from the same manufacturer? Yes. All the ammunition that I encountered in all my exhibits associated with this case were Wolf manufactured ammunition. And the ammunition that was in government exhibit, that, that is government exhibit 101.1, the shell casings that you used versus the shell casings found on scene, could you tell if they were fired from the same gun? Um, you mean the fired ones that were found at the scene? And, and yours, fired ones? Yes, they were all fired from the same gun. And for the record, let me correct one thing. There was one magazine for a handgun with different handgun ammunition. Um, I'm excluding that when I say everything else was the same. Okay. We're going to talk about um, ejection patterns. And I forgot to grab a photo. So we're shifting off to ejection patterns. Did you conduct an ejection pattern test in this case? Yes, I fired a total of 10 rounds at an outdoor range with ample room to show where the cartridge cases would come to rest after they were fired. And this is where, where we left off. I made a copy for counsel. Permission to approach the witness, Your Honor? Granted. 
This is going to be newly marked state 12.5. What I did, Aaron, is from your report, I culled out of there the photographs relating to the ejection pattern. You recognize those photographs? Yes, I do. I took these photographs at the range the day I did the ejection pattern testing. Do you remember when you took when you did the ejection pattern testing? I don't recall the exact date. I apologize. Would your report help you refresh? It may. Yeah. I've got four other reports here. Would you, do you want them all? Um, actually, I was just looking at the chain of custody. Uh -huh. um, all this work was done approximately at the same time. It would have been uh, last summer. Um, if, I'm just not sure if I can pinpoint the exact date. I went to the range and fired these specific specimens. Summertime of 2023? Correct, yes. All right. Move to admit Government Exhibit 12.5, which is the photographs from his report. No objection. 12.5 is admitted. Permission to publish, Your Honor? Granted. I'm going to first show you Government Exhibit 34. Image 4438. You recognize that photo? This has already been admitted. You recognize that photo, Aaron? Um, I believe I've seen that before. It was a photo from the scene showing the location of recovered cartridge cases. Would that be, when you, when you say recovered cartridges, would that be like indicative of an ejection pattern seen on scene? Uh, it would be related to that, possibly, yes. All right. I'm going to show you Government Exhibit 12.5. I'm going to show you first image. 12.5, I'm going to mark it as 12.5A. Do you recognize what that is? Yes, um, this is a photograph showing the initial setup of the grid I was attempting to use for my ejection pattern testing. Uh, the red cone that you can see on the left edge of that image would be directly where I was standing for the test firing. The line formed between the green and the yellow, between the red, uh, that line is essentially the line of which I was aiming the rifle for all of the shots I fired. If you look at the top of the image, you can see the berm that was, I can't recall the exact range, but it was about 100 yards or more. And so I picked a spot on that berm for a consistent aiming point for the duration of the test firing. Cartridge cases that were ejected from the rifle would have gone to the right and slightly forward, and later photos that I think we're about to see document those locations as well. And you can draw on that screen. Oh. And so can you just circle where you were standing? Perfect, yes, yeah, so I would have been standing here and firing in this direction, and the cartridge cases were generally speaking landing here. And this is a line formed by a scale that I had set out before we started shooting so that I could have some measurements to work from. And you can clear the bottom, bottom left will clear. Got it. Thank you. I'll show you the next photo. Is that a close up photo? Yes, this is again the same area and it was before the test firing began. What's the, the yellow object in there? Um, the yellow object, there's actually two. There's a, a second um, measuring tape, which is sort of this item here, and that's to do the um, vertical, or if I shouldn't say vertical, the, 
the uh, um, other access measurements, so how far forward or back the cartridge cases would go. Um, there's already a measuring tape on the ground here. And then this is a container that has what we call placards. These are markers that basically have numbers on them. For each shot that I fired, I used a numbered marker to show where the cartridge case initially impacted, and then a second numbered marker to show where it came to rest after final bounce. The idea being I can have two pieces of data for every shot that show the bounce on the hard surface and the locations of those cartridge cases and where they landed. The reason that would be relevant is if, for example, the, uh, the scene had cartridge cases landing on grass or beach sand or someplace where they wouldn't bounce, the first set of data would be more relevant versus a hard surface where the second set of data is more relevant. And you got someone with you, right? Correct. I had an assistant as well. And, and you, do you remember what that surface is? It's basically a kind of a hard-packed earth, um, fairly solid. I'll show you the next photo, photo number three. What are we looking at there? Sorry, I'm clearing you. Um, this is essentially after the test firing has begun, and the individual cartridge cases have landed in the area denoted by the individual white placards that I was just describing. Now, you can't see them very clearly in this image, but I took close-ups showing those, those photos of the various um, impact sites. And, for example, the first shot I fired, number one would indicate where it first hit, and number two would indicate where it came to rest. So I have a series of photos I took showing one and two, then three and four, five and six, and so on, and collecting that information on a, a chart so that I could plot this later. And that's the berm? In the back you're talking about? Correct, yes. Image number four? Uh, this is a close-up of where those placards are as a cluster. It doesn't show the origin point in the photo. But we can start seeing ones, and <coughs> we can start seeing numbers in there, right? Correct. I think this is 13, if I'm reading the image correctly on the screen. Uh, I think there's... see number one? I believe that's number one, I believe. Is that, does this picture dictate where number two is at? I don't believe so, but one of the reasons is the second set of numbers, so number two would be facing 90 degrees. I did that intentionally so I could take the photos from different perspectives and show the cluster in a different light. Um, so right now we're seeing the initial impact. That's why these are all odd numbers. Odd numbers show initial impact and facing the, the camera view on this. Correct. I think I've got another image. That's a close-up? Yep. yep, this is a close-up showing, again, all the odd numbers. The even numbers would be ones like this one here, where the placard's 90 degrees, so you can't see the number on the placard at this point, but a photo taken from a different perspective would show it. So each of the 10 rounds have got two numbers associated with them, right? Correct. Initial impact and resting spot. Yes, that's correct. Initial impact is odds, resting spot's even. Correct. What are we looking at? Uh, this would be from the perspective of where I was shooting, but because it's a 90-degree angle, now you're seeing the even numbers. Here's 14, for example. Can you see the number two that's now? Number 12. I believe that's number two, but I, it's a little fuzzy on the screen. I have other images that will probably show up more clearly. Another view of that? Uh, basically the similar photo. It's a close-up, closer up. Correct, and showing all the see, evens. I'm sorry. I'm oh, yes, yeah, showing all the even numbers. And now you can see number two on there? Yeah, number two appears to be right there. Can you tell, do you remember where number one's at? Um, I don't recall, but I do have this diagrammed on a, on a chart we could look at if we needed to. So here we see number one and number two relative to each other. So for the first shot fired, it would have initially hit here and then bounced to that location and come to rest. It may have bounced once or twice or rolled, but at some point it first impacted the ground at the site where number one is and it came to rest where number two is. And this is not a memorization test. You, you fire one time and then someone measures. Correct. Okay. And you fire again 
and you measure again. And I have these listed in my notes too. I took notes of these locations. Another shot? Yeah, so here would be three and four, and that's the series of photos we're looking at now are all like that. So three has the initial impact, four has the final bounce position. And you'll see a trend for the most part is the cartridge case is moving one direction, even when it hits and bounces, it normally continues that other direction before it comes to rest. There's always going to be the possibility for exceptions. If there was a big rock and the thing bounced into it, it might bounce a different direction. And there is some forward and backwards as well. And you recall see it exhibit 101, the AK-47? The, the rifle? The rifle? Yes. Right. And which direction does the ejection happen on that rifle? Essentially, it comes to the right and slightly forward. So as you're shooting the rifle, the cartridge cases will go anywhere between 10 and 30 feet to the right and approximately five feet forward as a group. But individual um, cartridges are gonna land where they land. It's a, it's a not perfectly reproducible experiment. And does it matter if uh, right-handed shooter versus left-handed shooter with that AK-47, the ejection? Uh, I don't believe so, unless for some reason the left-handed shooter is holding the gun in such a way that maybe their arm, their right arm is blocking the path of the cartridges. That's unlikely. That's a close-up of five and six? Correct. And again, five and six are fairly close. They, so it didn't bounce very far in this case. But that's not necessarily true with every single one. This is a random hit and rest spot thing going on. Correct, and, and randoms is good a description of this. I mean, it's going to have a pattern over time. If I did 20 or 30 or 40 shots, we might have a, a, a better picture. But essentially, this is a, a rough way to determine where the cartridge cases are going to go from where the gun is fired. Uh, normally, we only do this for the purposes of, of uh, finding out if the cartridge cases are where in the general vicinity of where they should be. Or in some cases, if, say, the shooter's moving, you're going to see a different pattern that distinguishes itself from a stationary pattern like this. And another shot with different numbers, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think 7 and 8, they're right there in the corner, and there's a few others maybe visible as well, 19 and 20. 9 and 10? 9 and 10. And you can see that cartridge case number 2 is visible. Um, these were all left in, in sight, and then they were collected and marked as they were recovered. Can you see the cartridge in number 10? Uh, it's not as easy to see, but it's right there. It's lined up against it. Same thing. I'm going to go through these quick now. 11 and 12? Correct. 13, 14? Yep. 15, 16? Yep. And again, there's nothing at 15 because that's the initial impact, and 16 is where it came to rest, so you can see a cartridge case sitting right there by the placard. We kind of double dipped 1920 there too, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. 1718? Correct. And finally 1920? Yep. <clears throat> Last two images. What are we looking at? on last, second to last in, image on government exhibit 12.5. So as those cartridge cases were collected from the ground, I marked them one through 10 you know, with a Sharpie on the outside of the cartridge case um, and collected them as one unit. And those are the ones that are found in government exhibit 101.1, .1, the gun case? Correct. Oh wait, um, those, yeah, those are the ones that were packaged with the gun. Sorry, I understood. And that's the uh, like a real f rear photo of the of the round, right? Yeah, these were all the same type. Um, it's the Wolf brand of ammunition, and this is the n nomenclature for the ammunition type, the cartridge, the 7.62 by 39 millimeter. And looking at the ejection pattern, you earlier talked about finding agreement. Do you remember that? Your goal was to find agreement. Um, yeah, and or to look for disagreement if that's the case, just to see if there's um, a, a significant difference in the pattern shown by the actual um, cartridge cases and the pattern demonstrated at the scene from where they were recovered. All right, I'm going to do two photos, interchange them so we can talk about them real quick. Government Exhibit 34, image 4438. You recall that photo? I do. 
and we're going to take a look at your exhibit 12.5. It's an, it's an out view image of the ejection pattern. Uh, yes. Are these two, in your opinion, consistent? They are, or more to the sense they're not inconsistent with each other. You might see differences in where you know, some of these are. I fired 10. There were, I believe, eight in that last photo. Um, but whatever the case, the um, patterns are not distinct from each other. I can't look at one and say it rules out the possibility of the other, for example. Now, if there was a whole line of cartridge cases that stretched out for 50 yards, that would be a distinction worth noting, and that would indicate something else, like perhaps the shooter was moving at the time the shots were fired. And there are variables that go into the ejection pattern as you review it, right? Yes, there are several. Yeah. Like, what are some of the key variables that will change if I'm looking at the scene, the photo of the scene versus your testing? What are some of the variables that can change, like on the periphery, so change some of the ejection results? I would say maybe the biggest change would be a difference in ammunition type, um, and that still may or may not show a change that you can detect by doing different patterns. Um, something changing about the gun, if there was some... Uh, alteration to the firearm, uh, a spring replaced, something significant, that could be an issue. Uh, what's not likely to be an issue is using a different magazine. The magazine typically only affects the feeding portion of the cycle of fire, whereas the extraction and ejection portion doesn't involve the magazine in most guns most of the time. Um, so there's going to be some things that could produce variables, but for the most part, we're looking at it. It's not a it's not a precise type of measurement. It's just showing generic patterns of where these things show up under circumstances. Another big variable would be if the firearm was, say, rotated 90 degrees so that the ejection port, instead of facing the right, is facing straight up. Now, that would change the pattern significantly. Uh, it's an unusual way to hold a firearm like that, but um, that's, that's, a, that's a significant difference that you can see sometimes. Would also the topography, the landscape change how bullets bounce and come to rest? Uh, certainly. I mean, obviously, the, the surface of the range is its own specific surface. Other surfaces are going to be similar or different, but for the most part, no two surfaces are going to be identical. And for the ejection pattern and for your testing, are you using generally accepted scientific methods? Yes, and this is the kind of thing that um, we teach regularly in addition to using it in casework. Um, when doing shooting reconstruction classes, which is one of the things I occupy my time with um, when I can, uh, we try to demonstrate this to classes of students. Um, that's one of the reasons we know about changes in those angles. Um, if I hold the gun in a 90-degree orientation so that the ejection port is facing a totally different direction, that's going to make a significant change. If I were to change the inclination angle of, say, a firearm, that could change things a little bit but it's less significant. So when we're doing these classes, we try to demonstrate big changes that are obvious. So, so someone holding a handgun, for example, pointing it straight ahead in this orientation is going to get one ejection pattern, whereas if they were to hold it sideways, it's going to get a different pattern. All right, we're moving away from the gun now and the ejection pattern. You also did some testing on a jacket. Yeah, that's correct. What kind of testing did you do on a jacket? Um, I was looking at the jacket to do two things. One, look for any of the presence of gunshot residues that would be indicative of the shot fired close to the garment, so at close range. And these are gunshot residues that are visible under the right set of circumstances, either particles of powder that you can see either visually or microscopically, or in some cases actual residues of chemicals such as lead that will show up in large uh, format when you can do a lead test on them. The second thing is to compare the defects seen on the jacket that are in consistent locations with the wounds described by the medical examiner and to look for lead residues that are present as the bullet passes through. To be specific, um, bullets typically pick up a lead residue every time they're fired down the barrel, and the first target they impact, if it goes through that, that, that surface, it will usually leave that residue behind. The term we use for this is called bullet wipe, and it's usually called that because if a person's wearing clothing and a bullet goes straight from the gun to hit them in the clothing, there will be this ring of this residue around the bullet hole that can be visible and can also be detected with the lead test that we use. So essentially I was looking for both corroboration of 
the entry and exit point with these two holes to see if I could find a lead residue on the entry point and also looking for any evidence of close range discharge around either of those bullet holes such as particles of powder or visible residues or any of that lead residue that would have come out as a cloud. So we have basically two things. Um, when I fire a weapon, there's a, a cloud, like a mist, like a sneeze from the gun. The sneeze is an excellent way to describe it. It's a, it's a collection of residues that will come out fairly close to the firearm and be deposited on, on objects or targets nearby. Um, but then there's also residues that stick to the bullet and that are wiped off as soon as that bullet hits its first target. And that can happen in any range. And most commonly, if we had a, a, a clean garment that we shot at a long distance, I would have a nice round hole with this bullet wipe on one side indicating the entry side, and I would have a hole on the other side that doesn't have those residues, and that would be the exit side. And if it was a close range, there might also be residues around that entry hole as well. Your permission, Your Honor, for Detective Ianza to come and open Government Exhibit 112.1, which has already been admitted. I'm going to approach Aaron on your report 12.1. You recall that image on 12.1? I do, yes. It's just a black and white, like a, like a clip art with some red dots on it. Yeah, it's a diagram of the front and back of a shirt or jacket meant to simulate the garment that I was looking at. And it had the locations of the defects that were consistent with bullet holes, both in the garment itself and also matching the locations of the injuries in the uh, autopsy. Here, I'm going to move, I'm going to use it for demonstrative purposes only. That, that's this one image. Let me show counsel. May I, may I publish for demonstrative purposes? All right. All right, I'm going to show you the little diagram. That's a diagram of what? Um, this is the diagram of the jacket I produced for my notes. Um, one of the defects is here, kind of on the right side on the back, and the other defect is on the front side, just to the left of midline. Um, and as I indicate in the summary of my results, um, I found no visible um, powder particles or residues. And the test, it's called sodium rhodizinate test for lead, was negative. So I found no traces of lead. Um, so the way I interpret that combination um, basically is that it's inconclusive. That is to say I can't confirm that those two holes are from a bullet hole because I don't have residues that indicate that directly. Um, in the context, though, it, that's, they appear to be bullet holes, and I have no independent way to corroborate or disagree with the medical examiner's assessment of entry versus exit. But the question I've got for you is, we've got two categories, bullet wipe and bullet sneeze. Sure. Is there any bullet sneeze on the coat that you found? No, I found no indications of close range residue at all. And what, when you say close range, what are we talking about? Um, it's going to vary from gun to gun. But let's say, in a simple example, if you're two to three feet away, those residues are going to come out and produce a pattern, and it's going to vary based on the combination of firearm and ammunition, the velocities, other factors. But at those distances, you might likely see particles of powder, and if it's even closer, you might actually see residues that are visible, like sooting, um, other indications of close-range discharge. Um, if you're 20 feet away, it's unlikely you'll see any of that. You're on permission for Detective Ianza to take out 112.1 and lay it on the table? And Detective, can you lay it with the back side up? Permission for the witness to step down to identify. Aaron, you want to step on down? And since detectives got the gloves on, Aaron, you want to identify, is this the same coat that you analyzed in your GSR testing? Yes, I recognize it. Hmm. Sorry. 
You do recognize it? Yes, I do. Oh. Yes, I recognize it. Can you help identify, um, Detective Anza, help him identify where the bullet hole? I can point to it. Sure. Would you help him point to it? And I Detective help. Anza will help out. I'll use a flashlight and light it up. There's a spot there you can see the defect in the garment. Um, right there. Right there. And it's indicative of where it's marked on the actual diagram as well. All right. And you want to... Identify on the front side for me. You want to hold it up? Doing the same, I'm lighting up where the location of that bullet hole is here on the front left side, just left of midline. Thank you. And you can take a seat again. Appreciate it. Thank you, Detective. And on that jacket and your results from the GSR, no bullet sneeze, but was there bullet wipe? I didn't see any of on either bullet wipe or bullet sneeze, as you called it. <laughs> was there, what's that indicative of if there's no bullet wipe? Um, the lack of bullet wipe means uh, to me, in combination with the irregular size and shape of the holes, as well as the uh, similarly irregular size and shape of the wounds photographed during the autopsy, it suggests to me that that bullet wipe was intercepted by some intermediate object. So that bullet struck one thing at least before hitting the actual garment and then the victim. And now I'm shifting over a few more questions. Shifting over to, um, we, and you testified you were not provided a bullet in this case to review. That is correct. If you knew. If you know, if you knew, if you know, was a bullet recovered in this case? To the best of my knowledge, no bullet was recovered. Um, okay. That's not terribly unusual given an outdoor scene and a perforating gunshot wound that goes through the person. That's not uncommon? Uh, under those circumstances, no. And if there was a, a bullet in, enter and exit, but then recovered, are you able to determine if there is a, any DNA on there or match it to a gun? Um, I personally wouldn't be able to do a DNA analysis on it, but it's, it's possible that a bullet that was recovered could contain DNA on its exterior surface from the person or, or whoever or whatever it passed through. Um, likewise, um, if the markings were of sufficient quality and were reproducing on the bullet, it's conceivable I could identify a fired and recovered bullet to the firearm, but neither is guaranteed. And if outdoor setting, if a bullet hits the ground, does it impact the ability to do either one of those testings? Um, I can't speak directly to DNA, although I would assume a bullet striking the ground at sufficient velocity could have uh, removed that DNA in that impact. Um, but I can tell you the impact of that um, on the ability to identify a firearm uh, could be significant. The effect of a bullet going through soil, for example, produces what kind of resembles a sandblasting effect to the exterior of the bullet. Doesn't mean it can't be identified, but it would make it a little more challenging at least. That's all the questions I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can, thank you. Okay, if I'm too quiet, let me know. I've been told. <laughs> okay, um, I just want to talk first of all about some of these factors that can influence the shell casing distribution while you're testing, okay? Sure. Is one of those factors, you mentioned ammunition type, right? That's a factor that can influence the way shell casings are distributed? It can, and I guess what I would say that is if you had two different brands of ammunition with two different types of charges or power levels, those are things that could possibly cause a difference in the ejection patterns. 
also possible that they wouldn't, but there's no way to know without actually doing the testing on the two variables. And the position that the weapon's held when it's being fired, that can influence where the shell casings are distributed, right? That is correct. Along with the movement of the weapon during firing, if there's any movement during firing, right? Yes, and if the movement is subtle, like a few feet here or there, in a case of ejection pattern like we've seen today, I don't think you would notice anything. The movement would have to be substantial enough to change the pattern significantly. So if the pattern is a distribution of, say, 20 feet by, say, 10 feet, which is approximately right, you would have to have movement that exceeds those types of numbers before you'd ever start to see it in an injection pattern. Another factor would be how tightly the weapon is held during firing, right? I, I'm not certain that that's a possi it's a possibility, but it would probably depend on the firearm. Um, some firearms, I think, are more susceptible to movement in the hand than others. Um, a rifle, especially a heavy rifle that's gas-operated like this one, I think is less likely to have that effect, but it is a possibility. And certainly the type of terrain where the shooting occurs can influence shell casing distribution as well, right? Yes, that would say is a very significant, significant factor because whether or not the cartridge cases bounce at all, and if so, how far, and depending on the type of terrain, it could change their directions dramatically in terms of which direction they go. They may not always continue to bounce in the same direction they were headed. They could bounce in a totally different direction. And so different kinds of surfaces are going to have different types of shell casing distributions on them, correct? It's certainly possible, yes. So concrete surface is going to be very different than wet grass, for example. Absolutely. Because things won't bounce off of the wet grass, but they will bounce off of concrete. Yeah, I use grass and beach sand as the type of surfaces that typically you wouldn't expect any kind of bounce because it's the first initial landing is cushioned by the stuff that it's hitting. And like you said, a, a, a really rigid, solid, non-yielding surface like asphalt or something or pavement is likely to cause a bounce. And certainly the presence of obstacles in the area is going to potentially affect distribution as well, right? That's very correct. So if there's foliage or rocks or other things that the shell casings can bounce off of, that could change things, right? Certainly. And other objects too, like a wall or a a large, any large object that a cartridge case will hit and bounce off of. What about the stance of the shooter? Does that have any effect on the shell casing distribution? Um, without getting more specific, I, I would say usually not. Um, the height of the shooter could be a factor, and if the person were, say, crouching versus standing, that could also have some impact. So that's what I'm getting at. Um, I think you said that you fired this rifle yourself, correct? Correct. And so you, you were standing when you fired it, right? Yes. And so you bring it up to your shoulder height, right? Correct. And I measured that at approximately five feet. But a different person who's taller or shorter, that weapon will be at a different height, correct? Correct. And the cartridge cases would start from a different height in that circumstance, correct? And certainly if the shooter were in the prone position, the weapon's very low to the ground in that case, right? That's correct also. Versus standing, versus kneeling, or sitting, right? In a tree, on a roof, there's lots of variables that could affect that, and height is one of them, yes. How does height affect the shell casing distribution? Again, it would be probably the magnitude of the height. Um, I think someone who's a foot taller or shorter, you're going to see a negligible change. If someone were, say, standing on a two-story building versus standing on the ground, that's the kind of change I would expect to maybe see a difference. And I say maybe because even then, without doing the experiment, there's no way to be certain. It could be that the patterns would be similar. What about prone versus standing? Is that negligible, or is that something that you would expect to see a difference? Um, I think it's, it's probably between the two. Um, standing, if you're five feet versus prone and you're right off the ground, that could show a difference. But again, without doing the experiment, uh, it, it's hard to know for sure. And so if you were to test something like that, or if you had a question, was this weapon fired in the prone position versus standing, for example, would you basically just fire the weapon a whole bunch of times from a certain height and then fire it again from a lower height and see what differences there are in shell casing distribution? That's exactly how I would test that question. Um, and whatever my expectations, I would measure them against the data. But if there was a difference that I could measure or uh, reliably distinguish between the two, then I would say it's determinable. Um, I wouldn't expect it to in that specific example necessarily, 
But again, without doing the test, I can't be certain. What background information were you given about this case prior to doing testing, if any? Um, not a whole lot. Mostly that it was um, uh, an outdoor scene. Um, I got no information specifically about the orientation of the rifle, just the number of shots that were fired. Um, and I don't believe I saw the, the pattern of cartridge cases before I did my testing. It didn't really require that I have foreknowledge of that. I think I only compared the two after the fact. And when you fired this weapon, you only did one test, is that correct? That is correct. I only fired 10 shots for that purpose. Okay, and those were the photographs we saw. That's where the shell casings bounced on that one occasion where you fired 10 shots, correct? Correct. And so you only tried that one magazine, right? That's correct. You didn't try other magazines to see if that would make a difference, right? No, but based on my knowledge of the firearm mechanics, the magazine's not likely to be a variable in this case. Is that true even if the magazine's made out of a different material, for example, plastic versus metal, that doesn't make a difference? I would say no, and in this case, the real factor is the mechanics of the firearm. As that extraction and ejection part of the cycle of fire is occurring, the magazine's really not involved. Now, there are some exceptions. I've seen examples of at least one handgun I can think off the top of my head where the magazine's presence does interact with the cartridge case during that part. But most firearms don't do it, to the best of my knowledge, the AK and this, this particular firearm does not involve that. And you didn't receive any information about any witness statements in this case, right? I don't recall any witness statements, at least not when I was doing my work. I may have heard talk about them after the fact. Okay. And you weren't told, for example, you know, one person in this case claims that he was firing shots in an upward direction. You weren't told that, right? Not that I know of, no. Not that I can recall. And you weren't asked to do any testing with this rifle aimed in an upward direction, right? That is definitely correct. Okay. But what you're saying also is that you can do that testing, right? Um, it's possible, um, and it would depend on the angle in question and having some knowledge of that. Um, for example, if I was told um, the rifle was fired, say, at a 30-degree angle because the, the shots that were fired were hitting a certain place and somebody measured that angle, that would give me some specificity to test. Um, but without that kind of information or a request for something specific, um, I would have to know, I, would, I guess I would have to have some reason to test it at a different angle and know what that would be. So if somebody were to tell you in this case, we have a dispute. One person says this weapon was aimed straight, and another person says this weapon was aimed in an upward direction. Could you help us out? Could you, could you tell us, you know, could you do some testing to try to determine if you can come to an opinion about that? Possibly. It would be possible to do testing at a different angle and compare the data set from the work that we've already seen and that new data set at a different angle. I would have to do it under conditions that were specified, so I'd have to have an idea what angle to test and keep that angle consistent. Um, there's some logistical difficulties, too, because on a, on a flat range, if I'm shooting level, I can shoot into the berm without any risk of bullets leaving the range. If, on the other hand, I'm shooting at some upward angle, I would have to have a facility or a set of circumstances that would make that safe. Um, but theoretically, it could be tested. Then the other question would be, if I did that testing and had the data sets, would they be different enough from each other to make a distinction? I suspect not, depending on the scenario. But without testing, I can't be certain. And they could be different enough to be able to make an opinion. That's it, a possibility, right? It's possible. And they would have to be different enough in the test conditions to be distinguishable. And then once that determination, if it could be made, was made, then we would have to consider the variables of the scene and where things were located. So even if I could do it in a test environment, I might not be able to turn around, look at the scene, and make that distinction in a practical scenario. Sure. But... If you were provided that information, you'd be able to do those tests, right? Yes, I believe so. And that would involve probably firing a number of shots at a straight angle, right? Seeing one pattern and maybe replicating that to, to get multiple data points. Does that make sense? Well, essentially that's what I did in the testing that we've talked about today. If you wanted me to test, say, um, a different angle, I would have to know what that angle is. I'd have to have a question with that angle in mind. 
I'd have to devise a circumstance where I could do that angle safely and collect the data um, and then look at that data. Okay. And nobody asked you to do that test, obviously, right? That's correct. Okay. You mentioned doing some testing of clothing, um, specifically the coat that we looked at. Did anybody ask you to test a backpack? Uh, no. Did anybody mention a backpack to you? Uh, not at any point during the, the testing and the work I was doing, no. And I just want to be clear. Um, you talked about that, I'm not sure if it was bullet wipe or bullet sneeze. <laughs> I don't think that's the technical term, but I guess sort of dust or residue that comes out of a weapon when it's fired that will stop after a short range. Yeah, I would say close range gunshot residues that are indicative of the muzzle being very close to the target. And very close is a non-specific term because every gun and ammo combination can be different. Um, and then there's the residues that are present on the bullet that will interact with that first thing hit by that bullet. I was just going to ask you what very close means. Um, can you give us an estimate or a ballpark? What does it mean to be very close? Again, I think the example I tried to use earlier was about two feet is close enough to start to look for residues and inspect to see them. But again, that varies from gun and ammunition combinations. Um, typically, rifles will throw residues a little farther because the velocities are a little higher. Um, but again, there's there's high speed handguns too. So, um, but at distances say ten or twenty feet, I wouldn't expect to see residues of that type. So, basically, anything from ten feet away or further with a rifle, you're not expecting to see that kind of residue. That's a reasonable summation. Yeah. So, if there is no residue, your logical conclusion is this shot was fired from at least ten feet away or possibly further, right? Um, that is um, a reasonable conclusion, although, to be fair, um, any intermediate object could intercept those residues. So it's hypothetically possible a shot was fired close, but the residues were intercepted by an intermediate object. And I don't mean anything substantial, something that a bullet can make its way through, but that those residues can't pass through. Like a backpack, for example? Possibly, yes. So you could see residue on a backpack, but not on the clothing that's underneath the backpack. I would think possibly, yes. And if somebody were wearing a backpack when they got shot, in the general area where the backpack is, you'd probably want to test the backpack, right? Uh, certainly for the same purposes. I might want to look, at least look at the backpack for any defects, and then if there's a defect, proceed as I did with the garment to see if there's any residues. But nobody asked you to do that, right? That's correct. I think you were asked a couple of questions about the wound that you observed in this case. Do you remember that testimony? I believe so, yes. And I believe you stated that the wound is irregular, which indicates that the bullet is not stable when it impacts the person, right? Correct. And you believe that could possibly be due to an intervening object, or the bullet hitting an intervening object before hitting the person, right? The, that scenario would explain the bullet instability and also the lack of a bullet wipe on the entry side. That's one scenario, right? Correct. And then could another scenario be that um, the weapon that fired the shot that hit this person, um, when the bullet leaves that weapon, it is in yaw? Um, it's possible. Uh, it's an uncommon phenomenon for a bullet not to success, excuse me, a firearm not to successfully stabilize the bullet, but it does happen in some cases, either with a mismatch of ammunition or uh, a firearm that has some kind of defect to it. Um, but that wouldn't explain the lack of bullet wipe, and the bullet wipe not being present basically means the most likely scenario is that this bullet struck something on its way between the gun and hitting the garment. Is there always bullet wipe the first time a bullet impacts an object? I don't want to ever say always because there's probably some exceptions that I'm not thinking of, but in most cases it is. The first time a bullet impacts an object, um, I'm just trying to understand the extent of the bullet wipe scenario. So if it hits an object, could there still possibly be that residue on the bullet even after it hits an intervening object? In other words, could a bullet leave bullet wipe in more than one place? Um, it is possible. The most likely scenario for that to occur is usually when you have a bullet that is not jacketed. 
And what I mean by that is the bullet wipe is a residue, a dark residue that consists mostly of lead and material of that type that's basically coating the inside of that gun barrel shot after shot. Um, a lead bullet, though, it will move through multiple objects, and that initial bullet wipe might be from the residue, but subsequent bullet wipes would be from the lead itself just being scraped off. So it's an experiment we do sometimes to show the difference. But even in that case, that lead wipe residue from a, a lead bullet, for example, would show up on the inside of the garment, not the outside, usually. Just going back to the wound real quick, I believe you said that the wound that you observed could be consistent with an AK-47, right? Certainly. A, a thirty caliber rifle bullet, it looks consistent with that. And could it be consistent with other types of weapons? Yes, this is not an exact measurement. In most cases, you can't really determine caliber directly from a bullet wound. The skin is elastic and has those other properties that, that don't reproduce the exact dimensions of the bullet. But based on what I saw, size and shape, it did seem to fit what a, a bullet in yaw from a thirty caliber rifle would produce. And what other types of weapons could produce the wound that you saw? I would say any um, thirty caliber rifle or something close. What about handguns? Uh, I, I don't want to say no. Um, they, it, certainly there are handgun combinations that probably could produce um, uh, that type of, of wound. Um, I would say it's consistent with what we saw, but it could be consistent with a large number of other possibilities, rifles and handguns too. Got it. Do you know if, an, if the AK-47, or AK-style rifle, I think you called it, because it encompasses more than just actual AK-47s, is that a common type of rifle? Yes, very common. How common is very common? Um, I guess um, I'll contextualize it to the southwest. I would say if I walk into a gun shop, I'm likely to see one or more available for sale. And same thing about same question about the am, ammunition. Is that a common type of ammunition? Yes, it is. A um, we talked about the bullet in yaw. Can that be caused by just a weapon that's dirty or has some wear and tear on it? Um, I wouldn't say dirty. You would have to have significant wear and tear to the point that it's. I would say semi permanently altered, so that's no longer doing the job of stabilizing stabilizing the bullet. Uh, the most likely scenario would be some kind of damage or defect at the muzzle. Uh, but even in cases like that, they don't always produce that sort of uh, bullet in yaw. Did you do any testing on this rifle regarding the point of aim or point of impact? Did you do anything with that? I didn't personally do that, although I did aim the rifle during my testing, and I saw it more or less shooting to point of impact at the ranges of the berm. And what's the range of the berm? I don't recall specifically. It's approximately 100 to 200 yards, maybe somewhere in between. I apologize I didn't prepare that measurement. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask about the scene. You just saw photographs of the scene. Is that right, the shell casings on the scene? That's correct. Did you receive any specific measurements with respect to those shell casings? Not that I recall. Um, to the extent that I evaluated them, I looked at the pattern and their approximate displacement, um, but I didn't do anything really rigorous, if that's what you're asking. So I guess my question is, how do you figure out whether or not this, the shell casing distribution at the scene is consistent with what you observed when you tested the rifle, if all you have of the scene is just a photograph? Uh, well, the photographs do have the same type of placards that we use, so there's a certain amount of standardization there. Um, I don't recall specifically um, what measurements I did see that were part of the photograph or what, where things were, but it's, this is not a precise type of measurement. This is not the kind of thing where if one pattern was 8.5 feet and the other was 9.5 feet, I would consider that a significant difference. There's enough variability in the data that I'm looking for something that's fairly obvious at quick glance because you're you're seeing big differences. Um, it's a fair question, um, but to the extent that I'm trying to decipher a difference from the ejection pattern that I have and the ejection pattern at the scene, I'm looking for significant differences that show something like a source of the shooter moving or a completely different pattern. And so you basically just do a visual comparison then? Essentially, yes. Okay. And it 
you kind of looked at these two distributions and you said it's pretty close. It's seemingly close enough that they're consistent with each other. Is Correct. And to, to be to be fair, if I reproduced my experiment those ten shots five times over, I would expect to see some variation between even trying my best to duplicate the results. I would expect just based on the variation of shot to shot that pattern to pattern you're going to see some variation. The kind of thing that the measurements might look different but not be substantial. And just to be clear, observing a shell casing distribution, even after you've done the testing of the rifle and let's say you know which rifle it is that left these shells there, that'll just give you an approximate distance for where the shooter was standing. Is that right? That's correct. So from shell casings, you can tell the shooter's standing X distance away from these shell casings, right? And I would use the word approximately at any point during that right. description, yeah. And then that approximate distance could be any radius around those shell casings, right? Um, yes, and I, if I think I understand the nature of your question, if I have a pattern of cartridge cases in one location, there's theoretically a circle around that that if you're pointing in the correct direction, you can produce a similar pattern. And you could, so you can't tell from a shell casing distribution alone which direction a person is firing, for example. That is correct. And you can't tell without doing specific testing whether they're aiming upward or straight. Is that right? That's also correct. And one moment, Your Honor. We talked a little bit about left-handed versus right-handed shooters. Um, I think you said that sometimes with a left-handed shooter, that can affect distribution if shell casings are hitting the person in the arm, right? It's theoretically possible, um, and I think I've seen it on one or two occasions, but they would have to be the right combination. The ejection pattern would have to be throwing them directly into the shooter's arm. So if I'm shooting left-handed, I might be holding my arm like this, but unless the cartridge cases are going directly into the path of where my arm is, it wouldn't really affect anything. So. Well, you probably don't want your arm to get hit by shell casings, right? Uh, They're correct. hot. They're hot when they come out, right? True, true. So it, it doesn't feel good, especially if you're not wearing sleeves, for them to land on your arm, right? That's completely fair, yes. Do left-handed shooters make any adjustments to account for that? For example, do they tilt anything to try to make sure their arm doesn't get in the way? Um, it's possible. Um, I think it really depends on if the need is there. And I guess when I naturally think of shooting in left-handed position, my arm is typically holding, holding the front of the gun in such a way that it's bent at the elbow, so there's a natural path for cartridge cases to go through. Now, if I was holding the gun in a different orientation, farther out, maybe stiff-armed, these are circumstances that they're a little less common and less natural, but those are more likely to produce that type of impact. And you weren't ever told in this case that we're dealing with a left-handed shooter, right? I don't recall. Okay. Yeah. Just check my notes for one minute, Your Honor. I don't have anything else, Your Honor. Redirect examination. Real quick, Aaron, on the backpack, you recall you weren't asked to do anything on the backpack, right? No, that's correct. Someone else made a decision not to submit that to you, you would assume, right? Uh, of course, yes. Let's talk about direction. Um, so if I have, I'm going to step out just a little bit. If I have a shooter who is shooting straight ahead, I've got an ejection pattern. Yes. And if my shooter aims a gun up a little bit to shoot over someone's head, would that ejection pattern be similar? Um, using the term a little bit, I would expect it to be similar. And I'd be hard-pressed to give you a circumstance that I could define where it definitely would be different. Maybe straight up in the air, uh, that would change things enough to see a difference. But I wouldn't assert that without doing a test first to see if that's the case. So if I have a scenario 115 yards away, a shot straight versus a shot 
100 yards ahead, above their head, would that result in a significant change in injection pattern? I wouldn't expect it to. And on cross, you testified that, I just want to make sure I understood that right, if someone is a foot difference in height, it wouldn't result in a significant change in the ejection pattern. Same answer. I really wouldn't expect it to. That's a subtler difference than what we're usually seeing. And as far as the jacket goes, the, the GSR testing, um, do you remember Detective Barba being present? Uh, yes, I do. And who is Detective Barba, if you remember? Um, I apologize. I'm really bad with names. <laughs> Detective Barber was one of the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's officers who, was, who brought the items up to you? Correct. There were, I believe, two that day that um, handled the evidence and did the collection of the gunshot residue. And how they collect the gunshot residue? Um, there's kits provided that have um, essentially a metal, um, it's called a stub. It's basically a, a device that goes into an electron microscope, and it's got a sort of a sticky tape or sticky material on one end of it. You essentially hold it and dab it against the surface um, to try to collect any of these residues. Now, these are not residues that I typically would analyze. These are analyzed by a third party, um, and they're primer residues that show up if they're close to a gunshot being fired. And did Barbara do the dabbing? Correct, yeah, around the garment and also what's called a, con um, a I'm trying to use the term best, a collection blank, which means one of those stubs was opened and left open during the entire process so that if there was any contamination in the environment where it was being done, that would show up in that blank. Do you know, were you there if Detective Barber then took those samples and mailed them off to somebody? Yes, I was present to observe and, and, and advise on the collection of those samples. And to the best of my knowledge, they were sent to uh, RJ Lee Group. And last question I have is, I just wanna make sure I understand the, clear, I wanna clarify the ammunition, the shell, spent shell casings found on scene matched the shell casings you used to demonstrate the effectiveness of the weapon and the ejection pattern of the weapon. Um, so use the term match. I, I, I want to I'm clarify. Sorry. No, that's fine. I, and, um, what I want to say is two parts. One, they're the same type of ammunition. So it's the same Wolf brand and style of, of ammunition. But the microscopic comparisons I did to the items collected at the scene do match to an identification level that I can say those cartridge cases were fired from that particular firearm based on my microscopic analysis. So the questions I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Questions for this witness from members of the jury? I see at least one. Um, let's see, this is from juror number, a little clarification, juror number six, who's six, this gentleman right here. Okay, uh, the question was, can you find bullet wipe or gunshot residue in an object without damaging what, the object? Yeah. That's what I thought, I just wanted to be sure. Okay, thanks, thanks for, just want to be sure we understood. All right, so one of the questions from the juror is, can you find bullet wipe or gunshot revenue on or in an object without damaging the object that you're examining? I would say yes in most cases. Usually it's on the exterior of that surface. So as the bullet passes through that first barrier, first item, whether it's a big thick chunk of wood or a single you know, stack of papers, it's going to leave that bullet wipe on the exterior. The sampling technique essentially uses a mild acid similar to vinegar, to basically extract trace levels of the lead and reveal them with a chemical test. Um, not only is that test reproducible that you can test the same area over and over again without losing results, but the, um, the testing is pretty mild as far as the surface. It's unlikely to damage that surface. The only weird scenario I can think of where it might have to damage the object is if, let's say, the bullet hole was inside like a hole in the knot of a tree and I couldn't get access to it or something like that. I might have to actually physically expose that first area where the residues are to get at it, but that's an unusual set of circumstances. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah. Good. All right, a couple more questions from another juror. 
Uh, and this juror says, this juror is trying to determine um, the possibility of a ricochet and whether um, a ricochet is possible from about 115 yards um, and achieve the same trajectory that you described through the body. Now, wait, um, I say, would, so the, the question was, um, could, and if you know, if you're not qualified to testify to this, then that's your answer, okay? But would you agree that the, or would you agree that the caliber bullet and the distance where, where the shooter was alleged to have been correlates with a ricochet to the irregular entrance wound um, if there was a ricochet uh, and looking at the trajectory, the bullet actually took through this body? You understand it? I think I do, and, and it'll take a little bit of explaining because um, there's sort of three different possibilities to consider. The first is a ricochet, and a ricochet is a very specific and technical term that we refer to. That's when a bullet strikes an object and in that interaction leaves that object at a different angle than with the one it came in at possibly, or at least departs at another angle. The relationship between the angle on the way in and the angle on the way out is not direct. So I could have, depending on the surface, a shot fired from a variety of angles that would ricochet off at a very shallow angle or ricochet off at a somewhat steeper angle. The former example, is a, a shallow angle, is what we call a departure angle from a ricochet, occurs usually when it's what we call a non-yielding surface. So a, a big slab of concrete, a chunk of steel, something that's the bullet is not going to interact with except just to bounce off of it. And in a case like that, the departure angle is fairly shallow, um, but you still will lose stability. Now, in something soft like the soil or ground or even like pieces of wood, things like that, if you have a ricochet, a yielding surface typically gives you a much steeper departure angle. So the way I would answer that question relative to a ricochet would be it's possible at a long range that the ricochet could have happened close. So a shot fired into a non-yielding surface fairly close to the shooter, but by the time it gets out there, you've got an extending trajectory. Even though it's a low angle, once you get to 100 yards, it's still going to be at a height that might produce that wound and trajectory. Or a shot that ricochets off of the soil relatively close to the person who was struck, and then you'd produce a different angle, but at close range would give you that same trajectory. There are, though, two other possibilities. One possibility is the shot was fired and did not ricochet. It struck and went through something, lost its stability, but was still traveling in the same direction. Um, and another possibility, I guess those are the two main ones that I would focus on. Um, there is something called deflection, so a bullet could have gone through an object and then changed direction on its way through. Um, again, these are all relatively hypothetical, and it's and without having a second impact site to work with, it's, it's, it's all speculation on my part which of these could have happened and how likely any of them are. All right. And uh, this next question, again, if, if, you don't, if you don't have a basis to give an opinion on this, um, then just tell us. But have you taken into account that the deceased may, might have been lying in a uh, prone position when the deceased was shot? I would say um, that's one of many possibilities. The human body has a lot of variability in its position and movement, um, and that's one of the reasons trajectories through bodies are difficult to diagnose. Um, sometimes you can, you can limit those practically, like if a person's sitting in a car, you have a realistic expectation of where their feet and legs and body is, or, or might be, but there are going to be variables within that. So with a person standing outside and, or standing or lying outside in an outdoor uh, scene, it's, it would be almost impossible to know for sure. All right. And there's one more question. And juror number 10, I can't read one word in your writing, so you're going to have to help me out. Can a makeshift single shot something leave GSR consistent with an AK? I can't read that word. A tube? That's what I, that's what I thought. Okay. Can, make, can a makeshift, just want to be sure. Can a makeshift single shot through a tube leave gunshot revenue consistent with an AK? I would say it's theoretically possible. Um, it would really depend on the construction and, and how close a fit the, the tube and the projectile are. Um, and then in a case like that, it would be the equivalent of a different gun. If I wanted to evaluate a distance in the presence of those residues, um, I would have to have something to work with. Um, the only thing I'm thinking that 
would change that is if you're talking about a tube that's never had any exposure to lead whatsoever. So there's no buildup of lead like on the inside of a rifle barrel. Um, that's a question I'm not really sure how to answer because there is going to be lead residue coming from the primer of the shot that's being fired and maybe the exposed base of the bullet. Um, we just we never see guns that haven't been at least test fired and at first test firing is usually enough to put enough lead in to give you the bullet wipe. So if it was the first shot fired from this hypothetical tube, um, I would say it's possible, um, but I don't really have an experimental basis to draw from. Our, yeah, good. Oh, we have another question. Okay. Before we go to the lawyers, let's get this question asked. Jose? There you go. Could bullet wipe be left on a soft surface like a backpack without causing physical damage to the backpack? I want to say it's theoretically possible. Um, the problem I see is if the bullet were to, say, strike a backpack under normal circumstances, that bullet wipe would be deposited on that backpack as it's going through the pack material. Um, the only thing I can think of would be if it came as sort of a glancing blow to the backpack and didn't go through it. And at that point, I would expect it would only remove bullet wipe on one side of the bullet. There would probably still be some left behind. Now, it may or may not have been, if that were to have happened, it may or may not have been deposited on the garment because once you lose your bullet stability, if the clean side of that bullet, say, hit and made the hole, I guess it's theoretically possible. But there's a lot of variables. Um, I, think, and I think the question, and if I could, sure, um, would it leave gunshot residue uh, if it passed by the backpack or close to the backpack? I don't think the question is if it went through the backpack. Is that right? So the question wasn't, will it leave gunshot revenue residue if it goes through the backpack, but if it passes by the backpack? So if I the, think if, if the projectile passes by the backpack. Sure, I, I think the projectile passing by the backpack isn't likely to deposit any residues on it without contact. Um, now, there might be residues if the, if the backpack was, was there and their shot was fired close to that backpack. It might intercept some of those residues, but without the bullet going through it, I don't think it would intercept all of them. That's kind of my best answer. Did I state your question correctly? Good. All right. Any other questions? Seeing none. All right, Mr. Jetty, um, follow-up questions to the questions from the jurors. Yes, Your Honor. On the backpack, I just want to make sure I got this correct. No bullet GSR is going to be left unless there is contact with bullet and backpack. Um, no bullet transfer, correct. Um, there might be close range residue on a backpack if it's close to a shot fired, but that doesn't really relate to the bullet itself. Yeah, we're talking about the bullet wipe. Correct. Right. And there is just, while well, we want to make sure the testimony, there is no GSR residue found as redundant. No GSR found anywhere in this case, right? To the best of my knowledge, none of my testing or the other testing done um, by the third party detected GSR. My last question is, um, you test, just answering the juror's question about the trajectory through a body is complicated? Uh, you, you said something that the trajectory through a body is difficult to diagnose. I think you, your response to a juror question was, it was in the response you said, trajectory of a bullet through a body is difficult to diagnose. It can be. Um, I would say I typically defer to the medical examiner for looking for entry or exit wound in the case of a decedent. Okay, and then you understand about deflection. Can the human bone, a human bone, cause deflection of a bullet when it enters the body? Yeah, a deflection event could occur going through a body. That is possible. One more question, Sharon. Ms. Larkin? Real quick. Um, just, you mentioned ricochets. A, a ricochet is something that will specifically change the angle of a bullet. Is that right? It is one possibility, yeah, and, and just to clarify, since we didn't really go into it in too much detail, a ricochet is what I would describe as a, uh, an impact that changes the direction of a bullet but does not go through the object, whereas you can have an object that, goes, that is shot through and that interaction can cause deflection, causing that to change as well. Okay. So both are possible. And you mentioned like hard surfaces like rocks, I think would be more likely to cause a ricochet because a bullet won't go through a rock, right? 
the, the phrase we typically categorize these as yielding and unyielding surfaces. Those are the two most common. But a rock is usually an unyielding surface, but it might be an irregular one. So it's difficult to, to you know, pick exactly how you would characterize a rock. A tree branch or wood would be a yielding surface, generally. Correct. Right? Correct. Wood, yeah. So it's softer, and that mm -hmm. means a bullet can either go through it. Or, e or either go of... through it or, in the case of a ricochet, go into it somewhat, and then its path is altered by that interaction. What about dirt? Would that be yielding or unyielding? Most of the time, dirt and soil are yielding surfaces. You'll get a little trough in a trench, and it's produced, and then if you ever fire a gun at a range and you can see where someone missed a target, you can see a, nice, a linear cut into the ground. That's usually a yielding surface in soil. So the sand moves out of the way of the bullet. Correct. You were asked a question about the prone position, and could this person have been shot in the prone position? Prone is on the stomach, right? Yeah, typically I mean prone is face and belly down. Um, the reverse is called supine, so if you're lying on your back facing upward, that's a supine position. And knowing where the entry wound and the exit wound are, if this person were shot in the prone position, then the bullet would be probably in the dirt underneath the person, right? In that circumstance, I would expect it to be if they were still in that prone position after they were shot and didn't move. Do you know how much deflection, you know, let, how easy are these bullets that we're talking about, the full metal jacket bullets that you tested, how easy are those to be deflected? Um, I don't have a specific answer for that. It really depends on the surface they're hitting. Um, I fired this type of ammunition through um, vehicles, through um, other objects on a range that doing testing. Um, but I would say it really varies more on the surface that it hits than the actual um, projectile itself. If it hits a piece of wood or branch, for example, is that likely to deflect it significantly or not significantly? I, I really think there's so much specific to that. It'd be hard to say a clean answer to your question because, you know, a branch could be larger or smaller in diameter. The shot could hit closer to the edge versus the center. Um, I would expect uh, a shot through a branch that's a few inches thick. If it hits dead center, it's likely to keep going through. Your chance of deflection goes up if it hits sort of on the edge as a glancing uh, uh, part. But it probably also varies on the, the exact velocity and the, and the type of wood and things of that that I haven't really tested. So you'd have to do more testing to make a, a long story short, basically. Right, and, and the testing would probably have to be tied to something that we would find specific, like, oh, there's a bullet impact in this space in between that could very well be the source of a deflection. I'd like to have something specific to compare the two. I don't have anything else, Your Honor. All right. Any other questions for this witness? Very well. Seeing none, it's um, time for our afternoon break. It's 10 to 3. Uh, we'll take a 30-minute break. We'll be back at 3.20, and we'll take the state's next witness when that happens. We'll be in recess until 3.20 p.m. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Please have a seat. And uh, we can bring in the jurors. Right.
Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of all the jurors, counsel, and the defendant, and the state can call its next witness. State call Sergeant Flores, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. If you'd come over here to the witness stand and please have a seat. Good afternoon, Sergeant. Good afternoon. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury? Yes. Good afternoon. Um, Sergeant Alfonso Flores, batch number 128. Can you spell your last name for the court reporter? Flores, F-L-O-R-E-S. And you were a sergeant at the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department? Yes. How long have you been with the Sheriff's Department? Almost six years. Six years? Give us your experience. What did you do before that immediately, and then your experience within the county, the Sheriff's Department? My career started almost 26 years ago. I began with the Nogales Police Department in June of 1998. I then attended the Central Arizona Regional Law Office Training Academy, which is in Casa Grande. <clears throat> After completing the academy, I underwent additional training with the Nogales Police Department within my, I would say, five years. As a, as a patrol officer, I was promoted to corporal. I remained a corporal for patrol division for approximately four years. And then I was reassigned to the Criminal Investigation Division within the Nogales Police Department. <clears throat> there, I remained for approximately seven years doing investigative work. And then I was reassigned to the Hyda Task Force, which is um, under the Homeland Security umbrella. I was cross-designated to work federal and state cases. Once I hit my 20 years in June 2018, I applied at the sheriff's office, and I was hired in July of 2018. And what did you do at the sheriff's department when you first got hired? When I first got hired, I, again, underwent a small or a couple of weeks of in-house training. And then um, once I successfully completed that training, I, I was placed on patrol. And within a couple of months or weeks, I was promoted to corporal for the patrol division. Eventually, you migrated into becoming a, de a detective? Yes. In um, December of, no, April of 2022, I was promoted to sergeant. I remained in the patrol division. And that same year, in, in December of 2022, I was reassigned to the criminal investigation division as the sergeant. So you're the sergeant of, can I just <clears throat> use the abbreviation CID? Yes. And that stands for Criminal Investigative Unit Division? Correct. Division. How many detectives work at the CID? Right now it's four and myself. So a total of five individuals? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that a big department, small department? It's a small department. And in your 26 years of, of police experience, dating back to Nogales Police Department, how many homicides have you been involved in? Approximately. Off my head, I can say over eight. Uh, I don't keep track. <clears throat> and how many serious investigations, serious violent crime investigations have you been involved in? Approximately. That would be over, well, over 15. And as your role as Sergeant at CID, what's, what does that position entail? It's uh, to supervise the criminal investigation division. M make sure that policy procedures are followed. Make sure that uh, the, everything within the criminal investigation uh, goes smoothly. You're the immediate supervisor of Detective Ienza? Yes. Who 
Who else is in that unit? Right now, um, it's, it's kind of a fresh unit, so it's a Detective Ainsa, Detective Puerta, Detective Barba, and Detective Muskis. And what's the role of CID versus a patrol officer? What's, what, explain to the jury the difference between the two. Patrol officer, they uh, respond, I would say, the initial call for service. Once it, it's considered to be a major crime, the scene is secured by them. And then us as CID, we respond and continue with the investigation, any follow-ups, any collection of evidence, just uh, continue with the investigation. Would it be fair to say that patrol responds first to a, a scene and then followed by you? Yes. You mean CID? Yes, Eddie. Were you called on to help assist on this case? I was. And do you know what case that was? Yes, the case out on Willow Circle. What? The case on 100 Willow. 100 Willow. Do you know? I've got your reports in case you need to refresh your recollection, okay? Okay. Non memorization test. Okay. Do you know when that was? Yes, January 29th. Oh, correction, 30th, 2023. January 30th of 2023. Yes. And you, you gave the address out there on Willow? <clears throat> yes. Do you know who the subject was? Can you? The defendant. The defendant, Mr. Kelly? Do you see him here, do you see him here in the courtroom? Yes. Can you point him out for us and describe what he's wearing? Yes, he's got glasses on, brown vest, blue shirt, gray hair. You want to let the record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant? So ordered. And I want to say, just, just we have a clear record, Willow Circle is obviously in Santa Cruz County? Correct. And what was your job? Explain to us how you got a call. When did, when did you get a call to go out there? Uh, Detective Barba and I were at my son's soccer game. It was his senior night. Detective Barba received a call like around 7 p.m., as soon as he received the call, he, I walked over to him and he told me that he had received, he had been briefed on what was going on at the 100 Willow Cross Circle. Um, after that, I, I just told Detective Arba, you know what, start heading to, towards the office. I'm going to have Detective Ainsa head over there to assist you with, with whatever you need. And I'll be heading over to the scene to assess the situation. Why did uh, Detective Barba need assistance? He had barely been assigned to CID. He, I, I believe he had like two weeks on. So Barbara was new to the unit? Yes. So you had Detective Ayanza also assigned? Yes. And what time, do you know what time approximately you got to scene? I, I just, the time it took for me to go get my assigned unit and just drive out to the scene. You know, may, may I approach the witness? Yes. Sergeant Flores, those are just your reports. I think it's exhibits 1.9, 1.15, and 1.35. So, like I said, non memorization test. So, if you need to refresh your recollection, let me know, and you can use your reports to refresh yourself, okay? Okay. In the reports, do you know, can you find out what time you arrived on scene? Um, it doesn't specify. It just says that I received, well, Detective Barber received the call and then I headed over there. Okay, so you, approximately what time? I would say about 30 minutes later. What, what time is that in the evening? It's, uh, 7 p.m., 7.30. 7.30. When you got to scene, explain to the jury what's the, what's the explain to the jury the, the scene, where you, where, you, where you park and who's there. Once I arrived on scene, I parked by the Keller res residence, and I met with, up with uh, Sergeant Rodriguez. 
And who is Sergeant Rodri- Rodriguez? He's uh, Sergeant Omar Rodriguez, assigned to the patrol division with the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. And what was your meeting with Sergeant Rodriguez about? He briefed me on the information that he had gathered, briefed me on what was going on. What information did he brief you on? He told me that the homeowner had stated that he had struck something and that the homeowner escorted them towards where a body was located. Once he saw that body, that he had noticed that he, the body had a gunshot wound to the back. All right, and this is uh, an example of, we're going to give you a limiting instruction. Remember, we talked about hearsay. This witness is, the information that he just testified to about what somebody else told him is not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Um, but just to explain the subsequent steps, the next steps that this witness took in his investigation. Okay? Thank you, Your Honor. So after hearing that information, what was the next step you did? I asked the, that Mr. and Mrs. Kelly be transported to the office for interviewing. Did you talk to anyone at Border Patrol or dispatch? No. So you asked, you asked Mr. Kelly and Mrs. Kelly to be transported? Yes. Is Mr. Kelly under arrest at this point? No. He's not under arrest at this point? Objection, no. foundation. Overruled. Good answer. Once he's transported to the to our facility, he's considered to be detained under us. Okay. Are you aware that he was put in? If you if you know, were you aware he was put in handcuffs to be transported? Yes. Would that be detained? Yes. And after Miss Kelly and it was did Miss Miss Kelly was she placed in handcuffs? No. So they, Mr. Kelly and Mrs. Kelly were transported to CID. And where is CID? It's at our office here on Congress Drive. Just right next door to the courthouse? Yes. And what was your next step after telling the officers to transport both Mr. and Mrs. Kelly to CID? I asked Sergeant Rodriguez to escort me towards where the body was at. And you went out there? Yes. What route? Do you remember the route you took to get out there? Yes, we, we continued walking down the, the path which, where we were standing, and then we went past the gate, and then made ourselves, we walked towards the east of that gate where we came to the body. And what was your job when you got to the body? What was your job? To take photographs of the body. All right. So I'm going to show you just for you. So most of these have been admitted, but I'm going to just show you, because I want to talk about these photographs. I'm going to show you State Exhibit 116. Okay. If my driver, Ms. Henley's going to drive for me. And just for you and the attorneys. Is it up? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you, um, can you scroll through those? Ms. Hunley, for the sergeant. Do you recognize those photographs? Yes, I took those photographs. Specifically, can you go to, Ms. Hunley, can you go to photo number 23? Do you recognize photo number 23? Yes. And do you, can you go to for, photograph number 49? Do, do you recognize 49, sergeant? Yes. And finally, can you go to photograph number 82? Do you recognize that photograph? Yes. And those are the photographs you took on scene on January 30th where the body is located, right? Correct. And those photographs are in sequence with all the other ones. I think there's a total of 82? Correct. You know, I think there was admission for all the photographs except for those three, and I moved to admit 23, 49, and 82 as well. No objection. 23, 49, and 82 are admitted. All right, so let's go through. Can we publish? Your Honor, may we publish? Can we go number one for the jury? And that is a very nighttime photo, right, Sergeant? Yes. All right. Let's go to photo number two. And do you recognize that photograph? I do. All right, we're not going to spend... The jury has seen a lot of these photographs. So, Ms. Hunley, can you go through them? Um, not so fast. Not so fast. Hold on. What's that a photograph of? That's the 
Photograph of the victim lying face down. Lying face down? Yes. Continue on, Miss Hunley. Right there. What's that a photograph of? Same, same just different angle. Oh, what, yeah. Miss Hunley, what image is that? That's image 28 for the record. And if you can continue on. You can continue. How tall was that grass as she's going through that? How tall is that grass, Sergeant? I would say it was about two, two and a half feet. It was pretty tall. Pretty tall? Yes. Did you see, pause right there, Miss Hunley. Do you see any signs of, when you're taking photographs, any signs of struggle? No. Did you see any signs of dragging? No. And you're the one taking the photographs? Yes. If you want to continue, Miss Hunley? And there's a spot, stop right there, Miss Hunley. You see that backpack? Yes. Any, any, did you see any discernible damage to the backpack, like a, a bullet, bullet damage? No. Do you want to continue on, Miss Hunley? You can continue. The jury has seen these photographs. Can you go to image 49, just so the jury, because the jury didn't see that before? And that, do you know what that is? That's my flash not working properly. Okay. <laughs> if you want to continue, Miss Huntley. I'm going to pause right there. What's that picture of? Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that? That's the, the backpack. That's a pocket of the backpack? Yes. You want to continue on, Miss Huntley? And the, hold on. Do you know what that is? It's the same backpack. Do you know what's in there? Yes, food. Food. And when you were on scene, was Mr. Kelly on scene? Momentarily. Momentarily. Do you recall, if you know, did he have his dogs with him? Uh, I don't recall. Okay. Continue on, Ms. Henley. You can continue. I'm going to pause. That's a, is that a picture of the fanny pack? Yes. And do you know what that's inside the fanny pack? It's food. You want to continue on, Ms. Henley? And we're, now we're seeing shots, pictures of the wound, right? Correct. And you recall taking pictures of the entry wound and exit wound? Yes. I want to continue on, Ms. Henley. You can go through. You can go through. All right, I'm going to pause. This is the, the wallet you saw, right? Right. And was there currency in that wallet? Uh, I don't remember. Do the next photo, Ms. Henley. You see that? Yes. Does that refresh your recollection? Yes. What kind of currency is that? It's Mexican pesos. Okay. You want to continue on, Miss Henley? Continue on. Continue on. And that's a picture. Is, is this a picture where the body has been removed? Yes. And do you know from looking at this photo which direction, what, what direction the body was laying? Yes. If you're looking at the photo, his head was towards the left, where you can see the cap. You can circle on the screen if you want. His head was right there. All right, and you can press the left bottom corner to clear it. If you want to continue on, Miss Henley. Pause right there. Is this when the body's been rolled over? Yes. And that's the position you found the victim in? Yes. Where is his right hand located? Uh, by his chest. Do you know where the exit wound is found? Yes. Where? Just a little bit on top of where his hand is, right by the chest. You want to continue, Miss Henley? You can go through it. You can continue. You can go, you can go faster, Miss Henley. All right, I'm gonna pause right here. You see, what's, this, what's this a photo of? That's a photo of the victim's footprint. Footprint, and did you, did you look around to find out about footprints in the area to photograph? Yes. And if there were a lot of footprints, would you have taken photographs? Yes. Were there? Just that one that I took a photograph of. I think we're gonna see it. You wanna continue on, Miss Henley? Is that that? Yes. And are we towards the end, Miss Henley? Oh, that's the end.
after you've done the photographs, are you there when Gabriel's body is put into a bag to be sh shipped to the coroner's office? No. No, you're not there? No. So what do you do after you're taking the photographs? I asked Deputy Felix to remain with the victim there, and I went back to my truck. And what are you doing? What, what are you doing at your truck? Um, waiting for the search warrant to be approved and executed. Are you contacting Detective Ienza about a search warrant? I am. And so you guys are having discussion about the affidavit, what will go in the search warrant? Correct. And then eventually you get notice that the search warrant has been approved and you go in and serve the search warrant? Correct. All right. Let's walk through how people, how officers serve a search warrant. Walk us through what the normal process, the normal process or the process you did in this case. Let me strike that. Did you follow normal procedures when serving the search warrant in this case? Yes. All right. What is that procedure? Procedures, once the warrant is granted, photographs are taken of the exterior of the house or the item that we're going to see, I mean, search, vehicle or house. And then once the exterior photographs are taken, then we, we start um, lettering the, the rooms that we're going to search with A through Z, uh, uh, as many rooms that there is. We have photos of the interior are taken prior to us searching it. And then um, once it's searched, we do exit photos to, to show how we left the house afterwards. And what's, I mean, I, I think there's been some indication from a juror or a question. Do, when you do a search warrant, are you like taking drawers out and dumping stuff on the ground? No. What's, how do you treat that scene? We treat it with respect as if it was our own house. We don't want to leave it with things all broken and messy. And you searched the, 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 the whole house, right? I, I assisted. You, I'm sorry. You assisted in searching the house. What was your responsibility in the search warrant? During that search warrant, uh, my responsibility was to scribe, which is just uh, noting down the items that were being taken as evidence. Do you know if, if there was an AK-47 found on the first search warrant, the evening search warrant? There was. I just want to make sure we understand there's an evening search warrant, early morning, I should say, early morning of the 31st. Right, this is after midnight. Correct. And then we have a daytime search warrant, right? Correct. Two. So on this first one, late night, early morning, you found an AK-47? Yes. Do you recall the conditions and what it was? It, it was fairly new. Was it in something? In a box. Were you a bri a, 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 a briefed on by Sergeant Rodriguez? about a weapon that was possibly used in this case at that, before that moment? Uh, no, I wasn't. The AK-47 was taken? Yes. Did Detective Rodriguez also talk to you about the body orientation that he found the body in? Yes. In which direction was the, which direction was the body facing? The head. Which direction was the head facing? The head was southwest. And which direction was the Kelly home? From if the body's facing southwest, what direction is the, is the Kelly residence? It was north. Would it be to the right of the body? We'll show up 116 if you want. Yes, to the right of the body. All right. And at that scene, when you're taking photographs of the scene, we, we're talking about a, a, a rural area, right? Yes. Are there are apartments nearby? No. Homes nearby? No. Streets nearby? No. Is there, do we need to quarantine off an area to prevent contamination from people wandering by? No.
Were you told anything about the condition of the victim when you arrived to take photographs? Yes. What were you told? That the victim, victim's hands were cold and his torso was, was still warm. Did you help remove the backpack? No. Who removed the backpack? Sergeant Rodriguez. Did you see him remove the backpack? Yes. How did he remove it? He had to cut the straps. What straps are we talking about? The backpack straps. All right, we, some backpacks have two and some backpacks have three. The two shoulder ones and then some of them have a waist one, okay? Yes. Which, which ones did he cut? I don't remember. Okay. And you guys looked in, obviously the photos show it, you looked in the backpack, right? Yes. And what was in the backpack? Just miscellaneous clothes and food. Water bottle, I believe. And in your taking photographs and looking at the area, did you find any weapons around? No. no. Handguns? No. Rifles? No. Did you find any large backpacks? No. Any small backpacks other than the victims? No. Do you find any drugs around? No. Did someone make a determination of looking at the scene, looking at the body, whether this was a homicide? Yes. Who made that determination? I did. And how long did it take you to complete that first search warrant, the late night, early morning one? I would have to look at my report. Sure, I'm looking for approximate too. I'm not looking for an exact okay. time. At approximately 2.33 a.m., we cleared the house. 2.33? 2.33. a.m. A.m., you leave the house? Yes. Is, do you know if Miss Wanda Kelly is allowed to come back to the house? She is. And did she? Yes. What did you do after you cleared the house? What did you do? All the items that were collected that night were taken over to the sheriff's office or to our facility and secured. And you had to conclude your, I mean, this is now, I would think about three o'clock in the, in the morning. What did you do after that? Correct, uh, just went home. Did you get some sleep? Somewhat. And then what was the next thing you did then? We started the following day. Early, well, not early in the morning, but early mornings, like around eight, nine. Were you, uh, were you debriefed on anything relating to the actual AK-47 found on that first search warrant? Yes. What were you told? That the AK that we found wasn't the one that we were looking for. And then were you also apprised of the situation to seek a second search warrant to look at other structures on the property? Yes. All right, so a second search warrant is applied for, and you guys go out to the scene to serve the second search warrant. Correct. Do you know what approximate time that is? Around noon. And you go to the scene, and, and just walk us through. What was the first thing you did when you went to the scene? What, what areas did you search first? We searched the barn, the additional buildings that were within the property of barn, a water pump shed, and then we searched the area where the victim was located. I'm going to pause right there. So we, we did pump house or pump house, whatever that was, and yes. a barn, right? Right. And then you went to where the victim's body was. Correct. What were you doing around the victim's, where the victim was? What were you doing? We were looking for additional evidence. Did you guys, like, visual look? No, we used metal detectors. 
Did you find anything using metal detectors of significance? No. And how big of an area? So if, I, if my body is here, how many, if I have a radius of a circle, how far out am I going? I would say a good 30 to 50 yards. And after doing that metal detector work where the victim's body was at, what did you do after that? We checked the house again, the main house. Why did you guys check the, second, the house again? Because I wasn't okay without, with not finding that rifle that we were missing. So someone had indicated this is not the same AK-47 seen with Mr. Kelly the day before, right? Correct. And so you go back into the house and you search the house again? Correct. Walk us through that. Well, we all went inside the house doing a secondary search, trying to locate that uh, the additional AK. Um, after everyone was in there, I just I was thinking to myself, we need to find that rifle. So I, I, I started looking into the, I would say into the bedroom myself. At that time, I, I stood by the doorway to that bedroom where we found the other AK. And I was just looking inside and thinking, what did we miss? What could it be? So the door was open. So, so I, I told myself, I'm gonna check behind the door. I'm pretty sure they did, but I'm gonna check again. So I moved the door to check behind it and I heard a thump. So then I said, oh, something fell on the ground, thinking it was the rifle. So I looked towards the floor and there's nothing there. So I'm like, okay, I'm sure I heard a thump. So I, I again move the door and I hear that second thump again. And now I redirect my eyesight towards the thump and I located the rifle hanging on the door hook covered with a green shirt. Looks like I wrote down the wrong exhibit number here. Ms. Hunley, I'm looking for the photograph of the search warrant. I have image 4247. I don't know if you have time over there, Ms. Hunley. Let me walk through. So behind, you go in the, you're, in the, you're in the house and you go to a bedroom which on the first search warrant was already searched. Correct. And you open the door? The door was open. Okay, and you look inside that room again? Oh, yeah, I was standing by the door frame. And then just, why'd you open it? Why'd you touch the door again? I just wanted to make sure that, that the, behind the door was checked out. Okay, and you did that and that's when you heard the thump? Correct. And you walk around and see what's on the other side? Uh, the, yeah, the AK rifle was hanging by the door. H hanging by the door or hanging on the door? Hanging on the door on a door hook. So like a, like a coat hook on top of, the, top of the door? Correct. Right, and then it's hanging by what? What's holding it up? The sleeve or... Would it, a green strap, would that be? Yeah, yeah, the gray okay. strap. And was there anything, and you said there was something over that AK-47? Yes, it was covered with a green shirt. All right, so you take that gun into possession, right? Right. And then you take it for processing, which means you take it to, back to CID. Correct. Was that gun identified by anyone? Yes, it was by one of the officers who responded to the scene prior to us. Can you just show the witness for me? You see 4429 on the screen? Give it a second. You see, you see it up there? You see it up there? Yes. Is that, does that picture look familiar to you? Yes. Is that the picture of the AK-47 hanging on the back of the door? Yes. The same condition as you saw it on the second search warrant? Well, it was more covered. You have a picture, the other picture? I think it's 4247. Four, Do you see that photo? Yes. Is that the same photo? Or yes. Not the same photo, but the photo that you're talking about? Yes. You recognize the condition, the position of that gun? Yes. With the sweatshirt? 
Yes. Move to admit, I believe it's Government Exhibit 46, images 4429 and 4247. I just want some foundation on this image that we're looking at. My understanding is this was taken during the first search. So if, if we could get that foundation, then I wouldn't. Hold on, let me, let me, let me back up. Let me... Sergeant, looking at, I just want to show you one image. Council's right, so I want to look at one image only. Four, 4247, you see 4247? Yes. Is that the one with the green, the green sweatshirt? Yes. Over the gun? Yes. Is that how you saw the gun on the second search warrant? Yes. Move to admit just exhibit 46 image 4247. And I'm object on foundation again, just because I believe this photograph was taken during the first search. Well, that objection's overruled. This witness, it, I don't know when it was taken, but this witness, we talked about this with photographs, right? This witness has testified that he recognizes this image, and this is the way it appeared to him at the time he found it. So when it was taken, who first found it, it's a different question. He said this is what it looked like at the time that he saw it during the second search warrant, and that's sufficient foundation, so the, that uh, objection is overruled. Move to publish, Your Honor. And that is Exhibit uh, 46, page 4247. Yes. Correct. Is that the condition, the, the view that you had of the gun as you opened that back door and heard the thump? Yes. And that's the green sweatshirt, right? Right. And it's draped over that AK-47? Correct. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm going to change well, that. Correction, right. correction, then it's from Exhibit 34, page 4247 is admitted. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henley. And that gun, just to repeat, that gun was taken back for processing and identified as the weapon that someone had seen on January 30th with the defendant. Correct. Is anything distinguishable about that weapon? Yes. What? The green sling. And did you take that weapon and give it to somebody? No. Who, who, took, who took possession of that weapon? Detective Ayenza. Detective Ayenza? Yes. All right. There are also some mentions of some shell casings in this case. Did you involve yourself with the visual and the collection of shell casings? I photographed the shell casings. You recall where that was relating to the, the property? Yes, by the back porch area. And who was with you in the photographs as you were taking the photographs? Detect or Sergeant Bunting. I did the same thing too, so. Just one second, Your Honor. Did you do anything else on that second search warrant? No. Did you go back on February 1st? I did. And what you do, why was the, what was the reason going back on February 1st? We went back to assist DPS that we're going to use their drone and also to, again, search the area where the victim was found. Search it with what? The metal detectors. And was it a, a more extensive search this time? Yes. The first time was a radius of 50 yards. February 1st, you went further out? Yes, we did. You find anything? No. And we'll get into... this later. I just want to make sure we understand you also reviewed some Border Patrol surveillance videos, right? Correct. And how many discs did you review? Two. I, I'm going to have to look at my notes on my report. Do you have your notes right there? Yes. 
Do you want to take a look? Sure. I counted five. Five? Yes. Okay. And there is a whole bunch of surveillance disc, surveillance disc DVDs you reviewed, right? Correct. And I just want to make sure, because we're not going to get into it, but I want to make sure, how, do you remember how many DVD discs were provided to you from Border Patrol? Well, it, it was way, more than five because all of us split some. So. Okay, that's what I'm asking. So you had five. Did who else was assisting in reviewing other DVDs? Uh, Sergeant Bunting and Detective Barba. And why were you guys reviewing these BP surveillance DVDs? To see if someone else was out there that day. That's all the questions I have, Your Honor. Cross-examination. If we could leave that picture up for just a second. Um, while this is in front of you, I just wanted to ask real quick, um, I see something in black in the corner there. Um, is that, did this photograph come from the first search or the second search, if you know? Uh, I, Detective Ayusa would be able to answer that. So he'd be able to say this was the first or the second search. My question is, this photograph, you can clearly see part of the AK sticking out from underneath that green shirt. Is that right? Right. And somebody obviously was looking right at it, and they took this photograph, right? Right. And is it a possibility that this happened on the first search, since the photograph also contains that black object there? It's possible. In other words, when you saw this um, AK on the second search, when you were there, do you recall seeing that black object there? I don't. OK. You don't recall? No. Okay. So I want to go back to the beginning. Back to January 30th, you were on your way out to the scene. Is that correct? Correct. And you had some background information before you got there. Is that also correct? Correct. Were you told that the homeowner had reported that he had struck something? Yes. So that was in your mind when you're going out to the scene, correct? Correct. And do you know where that information came from? No. So you don't know if it came from Border Patrol or if it came from dispatch or if it came from somewhere else? No. But you heard it through dispatch, correct? I heard it through Sergeant Lodi, yes. Okay, but he didn't tell you where he got that information? No. And it informs your view, I guess, to have background information before you get to the scene, correct? Correct. It tells you what you're likely to be looking at when you get there, right? Right. And so it's important that that background information that you get is accurate or as accurate as, as it can be, right? Right. Because that might change the way that you view the scene when you arrive, right? Right. Did you ever learn in this case that that initial information that you received was incorrect? No. So you never learned that the homeowner actually reported to Border Patrol, not that he struck something, but that something may have been struck? No. And that would have made a difference to you had you had that information, correct? Correct. Because it's obviously different saying something may have been struck versus I struck something, right? Right. So that might have changed the way that you looked at the scene on the way there, right? Somewhat. Okay. When you got out there, I think you talk about observing the body with Sergeant Rodriguez. Is that right? Right. And he let you know that he didn't touch or move the body, correct? He did check for vitals. Vitals. But yeah. other than that, he didn't touch or move the body, correct? Correct. And so you started photographing the body, including the backpack, right? 
Right. And you tried to photograph all of that before you moved anything, right? Right. And before you even opened up the backpack, you take photographs to show precisely how it was in the state that you found it, correct? Correct. And that's important because that's the only way that you really have to document and preserve the scene, right? Right. So you don't move anything and you photograph everything, right? Right. You saw the body and it was face down on, on the stomach when you arrived, correct? Correct. Not on his back, obviously, right? Right. And he was also in possession of a radio, correct? A radio was beside him. It was clipped onto his belt, right? Right. So it wasn't just lying next to him, it was attached to him, right? Right. And he was also in possession of a fanny pack, correct? Correct. That fanny pack was not really attached to him, right? That I don't remember. Do you recall it sort of dangling by his side? Yes. So it wasn't wrapped around him, right? Right. And it wasn't across his chest or anything, right? Right. It was out from, out from the body and next to the body, correct? Correct. Did you ever learn that this person carried his fanny pack in the front across his chest? No. And if, if he did carry his fanny pack in front across his chest, then it would be unusual to see it at the side. Is that correct? You're asking me to speculate? I'm at, look, assume for a moment that he carries his fanny pack across his chest. And I know you don't know that, but assume that he does. You would consider it to be strange if you found him with his fanny pack across, like next to him instead of across him where it normally is, right? No. You wouldn't think that that was strange? No. Would you, based on just viewing this person who's there, did you believe that this person was engaged in criminal activity? No. Before he w died, you did not believe he was engaged in criminal activity? No. Why not? I, I don't know his background. Did you learn that he was not a citizen of the United States? No. You didn't look at his identification that was right there with him? I did. And that identification did not indicate that he was a United States citizen, correct? No. And he's, he's, on, he's carrying pesos, correct? Correct. He's not carrying any American currency, right? Right. And he's carrying this radio with him, right? Right. And he's wearing a camouflage shirt, right? No. He's not wearing a camouflage shirt? He had a green jacket on. Underneath his jacket. Oh, yes. He was wearing a camouflage shirt, right? Right. And he was on Mr. Kelly's property, right? Right. Mr. Kelly had no idea who this person was, as far as you knew, right? I wouldn't be able to answer that. Okay. The information that was provided to you did not include any sort of information indicating Mr. Kelly knew who this person was, right? Right. Given all of that information, you would not suspect that this person was engaged in criminal activity? No. Is it a crime to trespass? Yes. So could this person possibly be trespassing? Yes. That would be criminal activity, right? Right. Is it a crime to enter the United States illegally? No, not under state law. Okay, under federal law it is? Yes. Okay, and is it a crime to engage in human smuggling? Yes. Drug smuggling is a crime too, right? Yes. And based on the fact that this person is probably not a citizen, there's no evidence that he is, has no reason to be on Mr. Kelly's property, and is carrying a radio, you don't think he's engaged in any kind of criminal activity? Besides the trespassing, no. What does the radio tell you? Tells me that he has communication. He had a phone with him too, right? Right. Most people communicate with their phones, right? Again, I would be, have to guess. I mean, you use a phone to communicate, right? It's a communication device, correct? Correct. And you don't think the radio has any significance? Well, there's no signal out there, so a radio might be necessary. If you're on somebody else's property. 
and you need to talk to somebody. You need a radio for that? You don't need it, but it can be used right. for that. So you don't think this guy's engaged in any kind of criminal activity based on what you observed, right? Right. The fanny pack that was next to him, were you aware that the buckle on that fanny pack was broken? No. You weren't aware of that? You didn't examine the fanny pack? No. And you weren't aware of the fact that there's blood on the fanny pack as well? No. And so looking at that fanny pack and looking at how it is next to this person, were you at all ever suspicious that this person might have been robbed? No. When you photographed the backpack, did you notice that the backpack was unzipped? No. I'm going to show you, I forget the number of your photographs, but I'm just going to show you a picture of the backpack, okay? And it's already been admitted into evidence. Give me one moment, Valeria. Okay, so I'm showing you a photograph of the person with the backpack, and this has already been admitted. This is one of the photographs that you took, correct? Correct. And that shows the backpack over this person's head, correct? Correct. And can you see that the backpack is unzipped? Yes. So now knowing that the backpack is unzipped, does that cause you to be suspicious that this person might have been stolen from prior to you arriving there? No. Why do people unzip backpacks? For many reasons. To get into them is one of them, right? Right. And typically, if somebody's walking carrying a backpack, they don't want things to fall out of it, right? Right. And so normally, if you're carrying a backpack, it's zipped, right? Isn't this all, the, isn't this all in the nature of argument? Uh, he said he didn't notice it, and he didn't think that that's indication of robbery. All right. The rest is argument. Let's move on. Okay. You mentioned finding in this backpack a water bottle. Do you recall that? Yes. And that water bottle had water in it, correct? I don't remember. Let me see. Give me one moment. Let me try 43. I'm just going to go to a different page in the same exhibit. Is that a photograph of the water bottle that you can see? Yes. And can you tell from that photograph if there's water in the water bottle? Yes. It looks like there is water in the water bottle, correct? Correct. Thank you. When you first arrived, did you notice a lot of blood around the body? No. Did you see any blood around the body? Just on his back. And when you say his back, which area do you mean specifically? It was the right side. Was it sort of under the armpit in that general area? Yes. And so you saw that after you approached the body, that little spot right there, right? Right. And then it wasn't until after you guys turned the body over that you saw more blood, correct? Correct. I believe you took, let me jump again, same exhibit. Hope that's right. Okay. Is that a picture of the track that you took? A footprint. Footprint track. Okay. And you took that picture because, did you believe this matched the sole of the victim's shoes? Correct. And do you recall where that footprint was? Yes. Where was it? It was by the two track, approximately southeast of the victim, or correction, northeast of the victim. When you say the two track, are you talking about a, that dirt path that was near where the body was found? Yes. And where on that, was this on that dirt path or near it? It was at the edge of the dirt. 
track. Okay. You didn't see any other tracks in the area? No. Only this one? Yes. That dirt path, I'm assuming you could see this track because there's dirt, right? Right. There's no grass, so this is a clear impression, right? Right. Do you recall which direction this track was pointed, if you recall? It was towards the direction of the victim. So, so east. It was pointing east. Yes. Okay. And did you document that in your report anywhere? No. Okay. You didn't see any other footprints besides this one, correct? Correct. Okay. You were present. Well, let me back up a little bit. You said that you asked somebody to transport Mr. and Mrs. Kelly to the station. Is that correct? Correct. Why did you do that? Based on everything that was relayed to me, based on the fact that there was a dead body on their property, based on that they were the only two persons present, there were our persons of interest. Both of them? Both of them. So you thought basically anybody who's present is a person of interest, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. So when you, tell, when you tell them to transport Mr. Kelly to the station, you didn't ask Mr. Kelly's permission to take him to the station, correct? I didn't make the arrangements. Who did you tell, who did you direct to take Mr. Kelly to the station? I asked Sergeant Rodriguez to make the arrangements. And all you, you communicated to him, just make the arrangements to take Mr. Kelly to the station, right? I just told him, have them transported over there. So in other words, you didn't offer them a choice, correct? I didn't talk to him. Mr. Kelly was not given the choice of whether he was going to go to the station or not, was he? I wouldn't be able to answer that. Okay. You're aware that he was placed in handcuffs before he was taken to the station, correct? Correct. What about Mrs. Kelly? What about Mrs. Kelly? Were you aware that she was detained in the back of a police car before she was taken to the station? I was aware that she was sitting inside a police car. She didn't have a choice about that either, did she? I wouldn't be able to answer you. Well, when you direct Omar Rodriguez, that's who we're talking about, right? Sergeant Rodriguez? Right. You directed him, take these two people to the station, right? Right. You didn't tell him unless they say they don't want to go? No. Okay. And when you tell Sergeant Rodriguez to do something, you figure he's going to do it, correct? Correct. One moment, Your Honor. Oh, yes. You received some information from Sergeant Rodriguez on the scene about the body, correct? Correct. He told you that the torso was still warm, right? Right. But the hands were cold, right? Right. This is in January, right? Right. It was cold outside, right? Right. And if we heard from a medical examiner that once a person dies, the body basically cools to ambient temperature pretty quickly, you would not argue with that, right? Right. So did, did you at any time pass along any of this information to a medical examiner? I myself didn't. Do you know if anybody passed this information about the body to the medical examiner? I'm not aware. Have you reviewed additional evidence in this case, or was your involvement pretty much limited to showing up on the scene and then doing those searches? It was limited. It was limited. So yes. you're not responsible for taking in witness statements and evaluating them, right? Right. But you did testify that anybody who is at the scene is a person of interest, right? Right. So presumably if witnesses came forward and said, I was at the scene. That would be a person of interest, right? Right. And if a witness comes forward and makes a statement, 
you would hope anyway that your detectives will evaluate that statement, right? Right. And they'll try to match that statement with other statements that have been made in the case, right? Right. And see if they match up or if they don't match up, right? Correct. And they'll try to evaluate that statement next to physical evidence that they've observed in the case also, right? Right. And see if those match up, right? Right. Because if a witness statement is very much contradicted by the physical evidence, then that might be a problem, right? Right. That might indicate a false report, right? Right. Before you arrived on the scene to take these photographs and to preserve the crime scene, other than just checking the vitals to make sure that this person is deceased, any sort of movement or manipulation of the body would be inappropriate, right? Well, it depends on the situation. Crime scene protection is very important, right? Right. Obviously, checking for vitals is a number one priority, right? Right. You got to make sure that this person is actually passed away, right? Right. Once you know that this person is actually passed away, then the best practice is to not move or touch anything, right? Right. Until you guys can come and photograph and preserve the scene, right? Right. I don't have anything else, Shiner. Be direct. You got it. Sergeant, let me go back to one of the earlier questions by Cross on Cross was, when you saw the victim, did you make any assumptions of who this person was when you saw him? No. About a US citizen, a Mexican citizen? No. Did that matter to you when you came across this person? Does not. In your determination, any hesitation to say this was a homicide? No. And do you know what kind of phone, cell phone, the victim had on him? What brand? No. You, you don't know if it's an Apple or a uh, brand from Mexico or anything like that, do you? No. So you couldn't testify if, if it's even operable in the United States? Correct. And you showed you were showed a picture of the backpack, um, the zipping of the back, um, the unzipping of the backpack. Do you recall if the entire backpack was unzipped or just a portion of the backpack was unzipped? Just a portion. When you took a photo to look inside in the pockets, did you have to unzip this backpack? Sergeant so Rodriguez unzipped it. So you had to unzip. So you. So I just want to make sure we are, we understand. You saw the you saw the backpack and you took photos. Correct. They cut the backpack off, and then you unzipped it and took photos within it. Correct. So the questions I have, Your Honor. All right. Uh, members of the jury, any questions? I think we do. Yes, okay. We have at least one for this juror. All right. For this witness, excuse me. With any witness, it's always if you know. But the question, a couple of questions from one of the jurors. To your knowledge, was there any detective work to determine who was on the other end of the radio? 
that I know of, no. Did anyone attempt to get on the radio to see if they could get a response from whoever might be on the other end of the radio? No, that's not common practice. Were there any prints, fingerprints on the radio to your knowledge other than the victims, if you know? No, that answer would be, have to be answered by Detective Ainsa. All right, very well. Uh, any other questions from the jurors? Follow-up questions from the state? No, Your Honor. The defense? No, Your Honor. All right, very well, sir. Thank you. You can step down and you're excused. And ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, 4.30. We're going to have our evening recess. Remember the admonition of the court. It's as important today as it was in the beginning of the trial. We will resume the trial at 8.30 tomorrow morning with the next witness. Have a good evening. I'll see you tomorrow morning punctually. I'll stay here in the courtroom with the letters. We rise and give the floor. I'll give the um, question to the clerk. All right, thank you. You can have a seat. Um, just talk, records show the absence of the jurors. Let's talk scheduling. Let me just hear from the state, first of all, more or less, where you are in your case. We were, we were, just, gonna, we were just talking about that. <laughs> so um, we have tomorrow, we're planning on several witnesses, um, Detective Barba, um, Castaneda, real brief, Monreal, real brief, and Heredia, real brief, and then... Um, BP agent Tercy, the BP video surveillance, and Heredia and Ienza. So, Liz Huerta. Liz Huerta. So, we're looking tomorrow. We've got five or so witnesses, and hopefully, we can start with Ienza in the afternoon as our final witness. And so, we're hoping to see him show his face up on the stand on, on late Wednesday afternoon. That's our hope. Okay, fair enough. All right, uh, so that being the case, and then um, we'll come back Thursday morning and take additional testimony, um, and we're going to go out to the scene on Thursday afternoon. Um, now, what I think we're going to do is we'll have the jurors, when they go to the scene, bring notebooks with them or something, so if they have questions, I'm going to have them write them down. We're not going to answer them there, but at least that way we'll have them when we come back uh, on Friday morning. At least we'll have them on Thursday afternoon, so if there is a witness or witnesses that might be the witness to respond to those questions that arise in the scene, you could have somebody available if you want. All right. Now, that being the case, um, we anticipate the state will rest. There's a good possibility the state will rest either Wednesday or Thursday morning. All right. So that being the case, uh, the defense should be ready to present any evidence on Friday if you have any that you wish to present. We do, Judge, and we did tell our witnesses Friday morning. Um, I just want to make sure we're not coming back to court on Thursday afternoon after that, the jury we are visit. Not. Okay. All right, so Friday, uh, the defense should, pri should, um, should be prepared to start presenting a case on Friday. All right, All right. and um, then we'll go from there. Enough. Okay, very well, then uh, we'll recess for yes, Mr. Jenny. Yeah, just one issue. Um, with the jury view, we, we have a right, if, in case we rest on Thursday morning, we can recall Detective Ienza to answer any juror questions if there are any. Yes. Okay. That's all I have. Okay. Your Honor. Yes, ma'am. I liked your idea, just wondering if you thought about it more, if we had a stationary person standing at the location of the body so it could be observed from the kitchen window, the patio? Well, I... I it wasn't my idea to do that or not do that in one way or another. I just, when I heard that testimony and saw those pictures, I figured they're going to go out there and there's a possibility, they being the jurors, will go out there and there's a possibility they're going to want to restage something like that. So I brought it to your attention just trying to anticipate a possible issue that could arise on the scene and ask you folks to think about it. Um, you obviously like the idea. I do. I think it would be, it's easy to stand there and look back at the house they can decide whether they could see the house or not. But 
from the inside of the house and then standing out on the patio, unless there's something there, it, they would have no way of reflecting. They would have no way of? To, to reflect whether or not oh. that was visible or not, to ponder right. that. What's the state's thoughts on that? Your Honor, if there's anything to um, recreate, it would probably be someone walking, um, people walking, whether they could see that or not. Um, so not just someone stationary. I think that's kind of the only issue. Because um, I think movement's easier to see when you're moving through that sort of brush. So I, I think we should probably discuss that with the defense, and then maybe we could talk to the court about that in the morning. That's fair enough. Like I said, I, I, I didn't mean to say I was for it against it one way or another. I'm just trying to anticipate the issue, bring it to y your collective attention, have you discuss it, and, and uh, if you're able to come to some agreement, then that's what we'll do. Thank you. And if you decide to do that, obviously, who's going to do it, you know, and with their size and what they're going to wear and things like that. Okay? Thanks for bringing it up. Very well. We're adjourned for the evening. We'll see you all tomorrow morning at 830. We rise.